up, everyone? I'm Jeff Lund, and this is the Mediocre Alaskan Podcast, where we are intolerant to weak-minded attitudes that keep people from pursuing new and exciting things in the areas of fitness, outdoors, and general lifestyle. Today, I'm talking with Anna Ulmer and Amanda david I'm going to talk to them again. Uh, they have a retreat coming up for, for women, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, challenging your own views in order to get a better idea of what you think, the power of community, and the power of being with people who are going to make things more positive in your life and communication. That's coming up, episode 26, the Mediocre Lasting Podcast. So the first, uh, first winner, how'd it go? The first winter, um, <laughs> I feel like I don't have a good answer for that <laughs> because I feel like right now I'm struggling. Like the other day it was sunny out and um, it was 30 degrees mm-hmm. and I was like, wow, what a beautiful day. And I went outside um, on this deck um, that I'm fortunate to have right now and it laid out there like freezing yeah. cold just to yeah. try to get some sun. Um, so yeah, it's kind of this part of the winter where it's like you're ready for spring and you're so it's so close, like you can feel it and you're sort of tired of being in this this dark lull that you've been in for so long because it's fine for a while like when you're in the thick of it, it's um it you can kind of manage it and like okay, I can I can go inwards, I can I can slow down, I can sort of hibernate and like curl up into myself and now I'm like I am so done with that (laughs) I need some stimulation I need to be outside more I need more freedom I want to feel warmer so I feel like this is the hardest part of the winter Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. getting close to climbing out last year I thought we had it about kicked yeah it was mid-February sort of warm up a little bit a little sunnier I thought oh we made it and then March was terrible it was five feet of snow and it was was awful Mm -hmm. but uh Hopefully it doesn't happen this year. But yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. Yeah. It's, you get a little bit of sun, but it doesn't have that warmth behind it. That makes a big difference, just getting a little bit of, of warmth. But what um, outside of the warmth, what else would you would you want? Like, Are you craving anything from, from a big city or from down south that uh, you've been deprived of for the last couple of months? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think lots of different things. I think just stimulation in general. I mean, there's this fine line of, of having... Um, that type of stimulation, whether it's a variety of restaurants to choose from or a variety of activities to have going on. And, you know, living in small town Alaska, sometimes it can feel um, like there's just not as much Mm -hmm. of that going on. And so I think with coming out of the winter and ready ready for spring, you kind of, I'm at least craving more of things like that, Um, just more activities and social stimulation and uh, that type of thing that is sometimes harder to find in a small town. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, not to say that there's anything wrong with that. I think it's just um, having a little bit of both is nice. <laughs> you can't escape the fact that Ketchikan only has 10, 12,000 people. Right. And there's, for a for a small town, it's, it does a good job of having activities and you know groups you can go and see, but it's it's still limited. It's still island in rural Alaska. You can't escape that. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah. But uh, you, Amanda, you anything? Uh... Well, I was just thinking of <clears throat> some of the things that help get through the winter are um, like some of the events that we went to. So we mm-hmm. we did have little pockets of the social s- stimulation um, that for me it just makes me fall in love with Ketchikan again. That makes it really unique. Um, like we went to the wearable arts show and. It's just, so wearable arts is uh, where people use recycled things or use um, just random material to make clothing. And it's just amazing to see the amount of talent and hard work and dedication that people put in for free. Like, they're not getting anything out of it except maybe a little attention in their product. Mm -hmm. And there are models who are just so brave and vulnerable, like dancing or creating this character on a stage that everybody it feels like everybody in Ketchikan comes to yeah. see and those are the those are the lights those are the beacons that really make me smile and carry me on for a little while longer um <clears throat> and like the monthly grind where it's basically like a local talent show where people just come and and the thing I love about it is that it's not refined mm-hmm. it's people in their more raw sense there are children there are people who are good at singing. There are people who are bad at singing. It's just whoever you are, you come and, and that's and that's who you are. But I think 
I think it is a struggle, though, because it is kind of few and far between to have something so big like that and those lonely days or those longer days and it's not quite sunny enough to like be out much past dinner and Mm -hmm. so those are like the day-to-day is hard but you can draw upon some of the the bigger events to help carry you through so speaking of events um you two have uh you're hosting a retreat uh can you tell me about uh, that when it is what's going on there um where it's going to be and what people can expect yeah, um, we're really excited about it. We're hosting a women's yoga and adventure retreat here in Ketchikan this summer. And uh, this is something that Amanda and I have been wanting to do for a long time and talking about, um, you know, ever since I first came to Ketchikan, I just, it's such a, like a hidden gem. It's such a beautiful place. And every time I left, I would feel kind of sad. <laughs> um, and every time I came here, I'd have these amazing adventures. And um, uh, number one, we just want to share that with people. Um, But we also specifically are targeting women. We want this to be, um, it's going to be six days or six nights, five days of um, women yoga and adventure. And we'll also be talking a lot about empowerment and self-care. And we'll be cooking really nourishing meals. We'll be going on um, a couple of big hikes. We'll be kayaking. Um, Amanda happens to be really good at archery. She's going to be teaching some archery, which will be really fun. Um, So we really want it to be this experience for people where they can feel like they can take the space for themselves, this container where they can come and really just focus on who they are and what they want and what their needs and desires and wants are and kind of shut out the rest of the world and have this amazing adventure with a group of supporting women. Have you gone to retreats before, or can you remember Mm -hmm. some of the first ones that you did go to as a participant? Mm -hmm. Uh, What was the most difficult part about taking all that you learned and then applying it to your life? Because you can feel really empowered and really excited uh, from that retreat. I've been on a couple of men's retreats, and Mm -hmm. it's great to get there, and and you come back to your regular routine. Um, how, how How do you adjust? How do you take all that? Yeah, I think that's where the real work begins. Um, You know, I hear people talk about that often, and I think the most important thing is that shouldn't be something that stops you from doing it because the alternative is never having that experience and seeing what it's like. And I think the more that you can put yourself in situations like that and have experiences like that where you feel inspired and you feel challenged and you feel... um, and maybe the sense of like aliveness and this sort of new perspective on life, the more that you can do that, the more it trickles into your everyday life. Um, and not saying that has to be a retreat, but it could be any sort of experience that you place yourself in, any type of adventure or something new or something that helps you gain a new perspective. And um, I think the most important thing is to be trying to challenge yourself in new ways of thinking and doing in your everyday life. And that then makes it easier for you to implement those those things that you learn on experiences like that um, once you get back into your day-to-day routines. Yeah, and I think that um, it really is a combination of experiences that we have. Like what we consume becomes who we are. So if you never have an experience where you step away or have an opportunity where you really look in, then you maybe won't be as deep of a person or like thinking as... Like you may not be able to cultivate the strongest essence of who you are that um you may not have this great impactful change like your life flips around 180 degrees but I think that over time the experiences that you put that you have or whatever you consume whether it's media or um meditation or you know where whatever you end up or eating like food I think that over time that creates the person that you are so I I I really think those things impact you on a bigger deeper scale than you might realize because we're so used to an instant gratification world oh I want this transformation oh I want this quick fix oh if I go on this retreat I'll be a better person Mm -hmm. maybe in the long run but I think that those things as we let them seep into our pores then start transforming that Mm -hmm. do you see people who are really excited about a retreat get more out of it than someone who's maybe resistant or sometimes the resistant person ends up having more of a transformation just because they wanted to not like it and not benefited benefit from it but ended up just being overtaken by it or does it really matter 
Yeah, I think both can be equally as powerful. I think oftentimes someone who might have some resistance to that experience, um, but the fact that they signed up for it tells me that they're really wanting something. So even though that initial resistance might be there, they've committed to it. and they So that tells me that there's underlying things that really was this maybe like intuitive voice or deeper wisdom inside of them that they know that they needed it. And so I think oftentimes those people can have really big transformations uh, if they allow themselves to slowly open up to the experience. And I have um, done retreats before and have had um, some people like that who throughout the experience I felt like uh, they just weren't really participating or um, they weren't really open to it. And then those are always the people that afterwards, like a couple weeks later, a month later, I'll get a really powerful email from <clears throat> saying how much the experience transformed them and how much it's made them look at their life differently. Mm-hmm. So you just never know how you're impacting people. And um, yeah, it's a it's a fun experience to be a part of. What would you say to someone who said, I'm fine, I don't need this, I don't need a transformation, my life is fine how it is, it's going to be what it's going to be. How would you convince someone like that that a retreat is beneficial? I, I think that um, <clears throat> a lot of people are okay and they're doing just fine and they don't necessarily need this like stroke of wisdom or to be in a vulnerable place to change. But I think that one of the things that... Um, I, I'd like to highlight with Anna and I, the way that we see this opportunity for people is there are so many, especially women who are caregivers, who take care of their children, who take care of their, you know, people around them. And there are a lot of women that I've talked to now that are caring for their mothers or their fathers or um, who are getting sick. And there's there's so much or dying, you know, there's that reality of life. Um, and there's, there's so much that women from the time of um, having a baby that they care for other people every single day. And there are teachers who take care of their children in their classroom and really care and put their heart out there. So I think that, um, again, one thing that I'd like to highlight with Anna and I is that we recognize that and we want to give people, these caregivers, a week to be taken care of. We um, love to love on people in a way that is like, we will cook nurturing food for you. We will give you a massage. We will teach you how to take care of yourself and just breathe where you don't have to be responsible for anything, anything for seven days. Um, And that can be hard for people, but I think it's also a gift to say like, let us take care of you. And some women never get that opportunity or never... um, allow themselves to do that because there's so much value in being responsible. There's so much value in being a caretaker. That's where people get a lot of their validation, their self-worth. So um, it's it can be really powerful and beautiful to feel that unconditional love from people um, that I don't think that we get often enough or allow ourselves to receive often enough. So I think these retreats for me, it feels like such a gift and opportunity to be able to to give that experience to somebody. Yeah, I would, I would agree. It's not that we're certainly not promising some sort of like life-altering transformation. That's not the point of it. That can be um, a, a byproduct of what happens if you come to an experience like this and really take the time to take care of yourself and focus on yourself. That can certainly happen, but that's not what, what we're promising. What, what we really want is this container for people, for women to come and to be taken care of. Um, and I think... Like Amanda is saying, so often women have such a hard time receiving because we're not taught or told how to to really like receive and take take in love or take in someone else caring for you because we're so often the caretakers just naturally um, in our biology and then in the way that society is set up, we just immediately go to taking care of other people before taking care of ourselves. And not to say that men don't do that as well, but it's definitely more prominent with women. So this is really an opportunity for for them to come and, and be taken care of. Mm-hmm. I have some friends that come up from California every summer and they're provided with the opportunity to just be outside and do stuff they wouldn't ordinarily be able to do and then take care of others, like you said, in it in the more masculine way that you can describe it, but just being outside and camping and doing stuff that's not available to them in California in the same, same regard, uh, you know, 
buying a whole bunch of steaks to go with the with the salmon and everybody wants to cook. Why well, have this steak recipe and this and that? They just want to be the provider. They want to do something different. They, they love being around um, nature, love being in it and hitting golf balls and, and all that. And it's such an important thing. I think people are unnecessarily driven away from those experiences just because it's, uh, it's just, you know, that's whatever, I would, not voodoo, but just uh, it's touchy-feely sort of, you don't, you don't need that. And I think that's one of the things that's missing so much in our society is that feeling necessary to a group of people in a positive way and not being as closed off. I'm going to do my little thing. I'm going to go home and just going to live in my little house and not connect with people. And I think that's one of the problems that we have mm-hmm. is the connections with people. Um, yeah. You're seeing it, it, with news with all, all the bad things that are happening, and people weren't connected. They were they were acting out in certain ways, and that's it's horrible. But. Yeah, and I think for an experience like that, even for a retreat or something, where uh, those people who are hesitant, who are like, ah, uh, just like it's safer to stay home, right, by yourself. Mm-hmm. It's it's safer, and not even in the in the realm of like. Uh, I have to be vulnerable, but um, I don't know what to expect. I don't know who else is going to be there. What am I, you know, what what if I hate it? What if this and that? What if, what if, what if? And then, um, and sure, we have that too. Who's going to be here? Like, what kind of person's going to come? Are we going to have to manage personalities or like, but I think that's exciting too. But I think that a lot of times that fear of, um, not having a good time or not being worthy of receiving something like that or maybe being vulnerable where you don't want to or it's too touchy-feely or whatever. But I think that if if people took more risks and just said, what do I have to lose? Yeah. Like, maybe it's a horrible experience. You can leave. Like, there's never, there's always a choice. There's always an option. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com/waypoint. That is mintmobile.com/waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com/waypoint. Um, I think that the more people take risks and allow themselves to just like jump into situations where they might not know everything or everyone, then I think those are the ones that um, are so meaningful because you put yourself out there. You, 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 you step out on that ledge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what else are you going to do with the time? You know, this is a seven day commitment or a three day or two, whatever it ends up being, you know, whether it's doing something new with a group of people, there's a very small percentage of your year. It's not going to ruin anything. So it's absolutely worth the time. If you don't like it, whatever you learn from, at least you tried it. Yeah. You, know, you can't be accidentally impacted if, if you know, you don't do it. Right. Well, I think well, uh, two things. I think one of the, uh, at least for me in my own life, every time I have put myself in a, a situation where I have been afraid or I have been uncomfortable, especially with traveling and different retreats and programs that I have done, um, there is always that moment of like, oh, did I really invest in this? Like, should I do this? Does this make sense? Um, am I going to like everybody? Am, am I going to hate the people who are leading it? Like, and then I'm trapped here for whatever, or I'm scared to go to a different country or go to a different place. And um, I think Alaska can feel kind of like a different country for some people. <laughs> Um, and every time I have done that, um, of course, they all haven't been wonderful 
life altering experiences, but every time I learn something about myself Mm -hmm. and every time I'm so glad that I did it. Um, because I think the more that we can put ourselves in situations that might feel a little bit uncomfortable, like the wider our circle of comfort then starts to grow in our lives. And then the more bravery we will find for trying new things in our daily lives and the more, um, other things come up in our life, the more willing we will be to take action on them. And, you know, it trickles into the rest of your life. And that's what I think is so powerful about, um, sort of reset experiences like this, uh, and then the other thing is really just uh, investing the money in that. I think that is a really big barrier for a lot of people because people don't people have a really hard time in investing money just for themselves, um, it, which is a really fascinating thing to to witness and watch happen and, and see myself do in my own patterns that you know, paying for an experience just for me feels like a really selfish thing. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that a lot for people who have come on some of the retreats I've done before that they felt guilty for being there because, um, you know, they either weren't with their kids or their friends couldn't afford to go or whatever. And, um, to me, I see it as if you have the opportunity to invest in something like this, it is a gift to the people around you because you are filling yourself up more and then you are better able to, take care of the people around you and um, just by being there and maybe inspires them as well. And I think um, that is a really important thing to think about, like how often are you spending money on yourself and how how valuable is that money that you're putting into things that, that matter to you and that are going to help you grow um, versus, you know, maybe spending money going out to eat often or food that's not really nourishing you or whatever it might be. Can you invest in um, your long-term wellness with, it, with things like this? Hmm. I think one of the most important things about community in person is as we're becoming increasingly more isolated because of social media technology you know kids are growing up right now with having social media as part of their it's part of the experience it's not something you can escape there used to be a time when it was your online identity was part of who you were but now it's almost inseparable Hmm. and so when you're you don't know any other world except for some sort of online some sort of uh, digital persona we're not hanging out as much as we used to as groups of people and that just those those kids are not going to become adults because they can't remember the, the back and forth like I remember high school I'm sure you guys remember high school too and you would hang out with friends you would go to their house and you would be where they are and you'd be present with them now people hang out together when we go on basketball trips and we have a team meal if we allow the kids to have their cell phones they'll have their cell phones out and sometimes it'll just be quiet because they'll have their cell phones out mm-hmm. so as soon as we take the cell phones and stack them together, then they're with each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's just a subconscious, you know, the addiction to it and mm-hmm. just the the exercise of being present with other people is it's being lost at a at a faster rate, which is which is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the the temptation to go do your job and then because you're tired, go home and sit in your little bubble, your little Netflix show thing and I, I watch Netflix for sure. But the long term ramifications of that is so practicing being around people is so important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the um, biggest things that I love, and you'll hear me say often, is the word community. Um, and I just really love the community in the truest sense where, like, there are all walks of life. There are all people who th- have different ideologies or religions or political views. And we can all get together and, like, share something, which is the love for our community, just, like, loving each other. I think it's so easy, just like you're saying, to be isolated, to be on our phones, and to um, be reinforced with our own opinions and thoughts that we create this division, and we create this... um, this thing where we end up hating somebody because they don't think the same way we do or we we put up these like these walls and these bunkers where we're just like no this is me this is my safe place like I don't I don't want to go out there I don't want to like I don't want to talk to you because you think differently than me or whatever but I think that um I mentioned last time in the podcast Brene Brown she really talks a lot about that and how it's hard to hate people close up Right. So like the more we can make eye contact, the more we can sit next to somebody, the more we can ask questions around somebody who thinks something differently can shape 
such a beautiful experience can help you have more compassion for people around you can help you um get out of your own head because that all of that too is like kind of selfish right like we go into our own little worlds our own little um lives and um we don't contribute to the community at large with a lot of people who may think differently and it creates a selfish society instead of this like this the society that we can really like learn from each other because we will be around people who don't think the same way but you can approach it two different ways you can push them aside and judge them and think oh I have nothing in common with that person or you can ask them questions Mm -hmm. where did you come from what is your frame of reference where is your how did you come to that belief how can Mm -hmm. you help me understand that I don't have the only way of thinking like let's talk about this people are really scared of challenging their worldview because it's their worldview and if it changes or if they're found to be wrong then well what have I has it been a waste of time but if you do challenge it you think about it then it not only refines what you believe but then you can also have a discussion rather than well it it seemed to fit and I like all the memes I saw online and so I'm just going to go with that Um, but it's things are so complex you're inevitably going to be faced with some sort of difference in your opinion or something you didn't think about and you're going to be confronted with a challenge or a roadblock and you're going to have to manage that and if you don't think about that then you know your worldview is going to be eroded without you knowing it it's going to collapse at some point yeah but the yeah. more that you challenge that and test it and think about it it doesn't mean you can have conversations with people and if they disagree then they disagree it's not a yeah. this is you know, the way my brain puts things together this makes the most sense to me sure. which is different than how you do it but we can still talk about it yeah. Well, I think a big part of that comes from us just not really knowing ourselves, not really taking the time to to sit with ourselves and kind of slow down and figure out why do I believe that? Why do I think that way? Where is this coming from? Like what patterns and stories are playing out in my own mind and in my own subconscious that are making me react this way to someone else's views? Um, and that's something that we're just never taught and it's not something that we take the time to do, um, just sitting down and being still and being silent or having those deeper introspective uh, times with ourselves where we're trying to figure out why do I have these beliefs in the first place? What makes my beliefs maybe different than this person's? And I think the more that we can be in touch with ourselves and realize all these patterns and conditionings and uh, stories that we have about our lives and how the world works, um, which are oftentimes really false <laughs> and are oftentimes rooted in our childhood and how we grew up, the more that we can start rewriting those stories and kind of dispelling them, the more I think we can find less judgment around the way that we are thinking about other people. And that from that place, from this place where we really drop our own stories, we can sit down and actually have a real conversation with somebody where I'm just being fully present and I'm fully seeing you without all of this background noise in my own mind and my own subconscious. And that's a hard thing to do. That takes a lot of practice. But I think that's why um, there's so many different tools that can help with that. And I think that's why things like yoga and meditation and uh, self-care and all of these different things that are available to us are so important for that reason, for connection and for community and having this real, honest, authentic and vulnerable uh, relationships with people. Mm -hmm. Has there been something that you had to confront yourself on, like an issue or some sort of worldview that you had to step back and really analyze and either it fortified your view or you changed your view based on new information? It's hard to answer. I th- there's so many little things. Yeah. It's hard to think of um, one big thing that really changed my worldview. When I was, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church, when they were doing the, uh, the protesting at the funerals of, of soldiers, I was extremely, just, who was not just angered by that? You know, putting up mm-hmm. the, the signs that... Uh, um, God hates and then you know a derogatory term for homosexuals and unbelievably inappropriate immoral you know horrible representation of, of a religion um, and so I was absolutely yeah they should be they shouldn't be allowed to do that there should be a law against that then I started thinking okay well if we do get to the point where we're making decisions that 
hey, government, step in and, well, that's inappropriate. It's socially unacceptable to do those sort of things because it's immoral. Well, then where does that stop? You know, all it becomes, you know, your First Amendment rights are then, you know, infringed upon. So as wrong and as bad and as immoral it is, it's still protected by the First Amendment. So what am I more scared of? These people showing up and making themselves look like idiots? Or down the road when there's an entity that's defining what's appropriate and what's not appropriate when it comes to our First Amendment. You know, banning hate speech or, you know, silencing what we don't like to hear. And down the road, that seems to be more terrifying. So my knee-jerk reaction was, yes, these people should be shut up, they should be arrested, they shouldn't be able to do that. But then I took a breath and thought, what's the implications of that's essentially censorship. We're allowing the government then to step in and say that's inappropriate. You can't say that. You can assemble, but not like this. You can say words, but not like this. And so we almost have to tolerate some level of that nonsense to keep the larger First Amendment intact. And that's, I still have problems with that. And you know, kids talk about it sometimes when we talk about First Amendment, but I don't know if there's an answer for it. Like, how do you get, per- that's clearly inappropriate. Yeah. And I think that those situations are meant to provoke something, right? They're meant, and and they'll even put, people will put things on signs that are just like really get people going. And I think Mm -hmm. that's the point, right? Um, And I think that you're right. There's always our first reaction to something, which is like, what the hell? How can they do this? How can they say this? How can they be so mean to Mm -hmm. a whole population of people? Um, And then there's the, if, if you allow yourself to take a step back, take a breath and say, what is this really about, mm-hmm. right? Like, where is this coming from? And I often think, like, I am so appalled by these rallies of people who can get together and have so much hate mm-hmm. or whatever. But in a way, it's connection yeah. to people, right? Yeah. Like, whether we believe that it's right or wrong, it's a way that this group of people um, gets together and has a common bond and they think, oh, well, if I think that way too, are you going to you know, like me? And we have this bonding thing together. Yeah. And it's almost like it's a backwards way of doing it. But it's also like it makes me more curious than anything. I mm-hmm. for sure have my first reaction of like similar to what you're saying. Um, or the opposite. Like there's a bunch of people rallying together. That's something I believe in. And I'm like, yes, yes. And I feel impassioned and I feel powerful about that. Um, but I think that it's also like, where are these people coming from? What are their stories behind this? Mm-hmm. Is there fear or is there something you're, you're trying to progress through? Is there something that, um, you know, I'm just really, it makes me come to a place of curiosity mm-hmm. with something like that, especially when people think so differently than me. I often think, where, how, is, how did you yeah. get to that point, yeah. right? Um, so, but I, I really do that. I think that those things come down to we crave connection Mm -hmm. and we will do it no matter what cults you know things that that come about like we want to be seen we want to be heard we want to be known and we want people to love us Mm -hmm. and sometimes people that don't know themselves well or are in vulnerable places in their lives will say yeah i believe that thing that you believe uh, and don't really know, yeah. and then and then like get really um, impassioned and, or like put their feet down. Yes, this is how I feel, and like won't change that because that's their bonding, that's yeah. their connection with these people yeah. around them. Have you read uh, Tribe by Sebastian Younger? I haven't. Mm-hmm. No, I've heard a lot about it though. Great book. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the introduction, it says modern society has perfected the art of making people feel unnecessary. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have a role, you don't have a purpose, you don't have a story you kind of choose the story that's the most available to you. And if these people are excited about something and I join the group, which, you know, it's a mob, but yeah, I feel important because I found a group of people, even if it's terrible. Right. Um, You know, it manifests itself in high school relationships or middle school relationships, people who just give you attention. So because I'm getting attention, I'm going to act out because at least Mm -hmm. I feel connected. Yeah. Um, And it's sad, but... Well, I think... There, that, that sort of is just like the reality of our disconnected society on so many different levels. 
And uh, this woman, uh, Lila June, who um, I really love, she says, um, you know, I'm not here to, to fight people. I'm here to fight ideas and I'm here to fight fear and I'm here to um, fight this, this paradigm. And what I think is so important about that is that when you look at groups like that, um, like the ones that you're talking about or, you know, um, neo-Nazi groups or, or things like that, when, when we're looking at those, if you could break down the people behind that and the leaders behind that, at the base of what they're doing is fear. Yeah. Um, and it, even like that, the one guy who was leading the um, what happened um, in South Carolina, he, he had, I remember he was interviewed on Vice and he was saying all these horrible things um, <clears throat> that were really, really disturbing. And then he, because he was showing guns in the video, um, I think what happened is that um, he ended up getting in trouble for that. And then they showed a video of him and he was crying. He was bawling. This like really tough guy that was like threatening to murder like all these families and different things. And he was like begging and pleading that he was afraid that the police were coming from him. And that um, so just to go from this like really intense, um, strong person with this uh, like horrible um, agenda to this person who's suddenly terrified. Mm -hmm. And it shows you what is really behind all of that. It's this insecurity and it's this fear. And I think oftentimes with people like that who are leading these... Uh, these hate movements or, or um, these oppressive movements, these are the people who have had trauma in their own lives, who have had some type of abuse in their own lives, who never felt like they belonged, who never felt like they had love. Um, even the recent shooter at Florida, they showed that um, you know both of his parents died, <laughs> and he was a victim of abuse. You know these these kind of thoughts just and things don't just come out of nowhere. And I think that's why it's so important to have these conversations and not have these reactions to, to people like this um, and spew hate back at them. But how can we really understand and dissect and figure out where this is coming from and how as a society can we do better for everybody? Yeah, there's a lot of underlying, there's so many details in the backstory that we will never have no matter how many times that we read. Mm -hmm. um, but the manipulators, too, in addition to the people who were just, I'm so afraid, I'm going to try to just hide all that. But the sociopaths, the, the manipulators who are stirring stuff up, you know, the quiet ones behind that, that do all the funding and it's preying on the people who do need something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, absolutely. And whipping them up into a frenzy and doing that. It's, I almost feel, I feel bad for the people. I don't know if I feel bad because they... Some people are, are, are led astray, and I feel somewhat bad, but they did allow themselves to be led astray to some degree. But the manipulators, I don't feel, I just, mm -mm. the people mm -hmm. have the money and the power yeah. and are using that to, and I, I just have no time for that. It's so, yeah. it's frustrating. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's definitely, that's definitely there. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what to do with that one. I think I think what's so cool, especially um, after this school shooting in Florida, what um, how much the the kids have been speaking up mm -hmm. and what that's caused, and all these companies that are now saying they won't offer NRA members. Um, discounts or um, different companies are ending their relationship with them, and I think it's it's really powerful when uh, we start to speak up. And, you know, the, the, those people with, with the money and the few manipulators that you're talking about are such a small percentage of people in this world. And I think the majority of people in the world um, don't often agree with what their agendas are. Um, and I think the more that we can speak up and especially younger people and get younger voices in politics and and things like that, the more that we will see see change. And I think it's really inspiring what these students have been doing. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's so easy to feel lost in such a big world where it's like, well, what what impact do I have? Mm -hmm. Right. And that takes us back to our just in our own little houses, listening to our news and complaining to our neighbor. Right. But I think you're right. It's totally inspiring to see um, these young people or even just yeah, pe anybody taking a stand and like not letting it go. It's not mm -hmm. just a week. Right. It's like, no, we are on a mission that this mm -hmm. is the last school shooting ever. And we will continue and that passion and the more that we can empower and embolden students, people like that just spreads like wildfire. Right. Because I am guilty of that, too. Sometimes I think, well, 
what impact do I have? Okay, I'll write my congressman. Does that do anything? Mm -hmm. But if you don't do anything, then that's worse, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I am totally guilty of it. I need to step out and do more. And I'm totally inspired by people that do and, like, take that time and, like, make phone calls or even putting things on social media, not, like, reposting some, like, catchy thing, which is helpful, too. But, like, get your own voice out there, Mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, I think that the more that we can foster that and like you're saying especially youth like go for it you have a voice we want to hear it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and and understanding a lot of kids look to adults and just see how adults act and it's very childish Mm -hmm. and you don't have the reasoning you don't have a uh, depth of understanding for what's going on. It's just uh, throwing stuff back and forth. And so kids see that that's, well, that's what it's, what it is to be an adult is just to dig in and then call everybody else who doesn't agree with you something bad. Um, but kids that understand and they want to go forth with, with their crusades, uh, that's important. And even down at the basic sort of you know, local level, what you can do is just helping people like we talked about before just that community of people and you have a voice and you're uh you have healthy relationships and that's helps people so much at the core level because i am happier the people you know investing in yourself so you're a happier person the people you encounter are then impacted by you being positive and then that has a real effect too um you know writing your congressman calling your congressman that sort of stuff has you know you might read a roadblock there but still, in your everyday interactions with people, that's how you can make an impact. Mm-hmm, um, yeah. And I think we sometimes get lost. Like, how am I going to totally change this big national thing? It can be difficult to have the stamina to keep fighting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but I think that's... In life, you have opportunities. Yeah, and I think... Um, like you're saying, trying to having that stamina to keep going. That's where our community is so important is having these conversations with people and realizing that you're not alone. Um, and I'm guilty of that too. It can feel just paralyzing, um, seeing what's going on with the world and feeling like no matter what I do, it won't be enough. It's not going to change any of this. And I think the most important thing that we can do is really, um, arm ourselves with the truth of, of our truth of our own experiences. And that comes back to, again, like peeling back those layers of our own belief systems and our own stories. And also to a larger scale of the, the truth of our country and what our country is built on and why these systems are in place in the first place and really peeling back, um, not just the history that was taught in school, but the history of, um, indigenous people and the history of black people and, and the oppression and the slavery and the, and the greed and the things that our country is built on these, um, all these things that are happening in our world now are sort of byproducts of what has happened throughout history. And I think the more that we can uncover, uh, the truth of what really happened, the truth of what's really happening in our society today and how our society is a system of oppression that we can start to come out of that and have this awareness of, okay, now where can I take action? Not only in um, my own life and embodying my own truth um, and what makes me happy and come alive and um, what makes me a better friend and a better partner and those types of things, but also on, on a global scale, what makes me um, a more effective citizen in that way. Yeah. I think lost in some of that conversation is also the, it can be seen as not very optimistic at all, but if we do look at where we came from versus where we are now, we have come a long way, which is nice. And we have the opportunity to continue along the path of remembering how ridiculous uh, and how horrible uh, our country was and how there are definitely some problems now. Uh, without question, but we do have the opportunity to heal a lot of those things and continue to move on past that, um, so we can remember. It. And I, I mean, I'm really torn on the judging history by contemporary standards, and we're looking back in the past of some of our, you know, more prominent historical figures and seeing bad things about them, and then reducing them to that, and taking down certain statues that are deemed this. And I'm. I'm kind of divided on some of those things because there are certain things that are absolutely symbolic of some of the injustices and they can be absolutely insensitive and I get that 
but I do wonder and I do question and I do, I keep thinking about, well, what is this? What, what do we, what's the end game with this? You know, if we keep looking back at the, um, the first presence that we had in some of the colonial leaders and, you know, they did some horrible things without question. You know, you look back, it was normal at the time, doesn't make it right now. What are we doing to our history by trying to character or go back and look at their characters and see some of the bad things they do and then bring that up? Like, what, what do we, what do we do by doing that? I and think are there unintentional consequences because of it? The truth, absolutely get that out there. But what might come with that? I think what comes with, I think, um, so what I see it as is that our history has been really like a white supremacy agenda, really, because it's built by, by these, these men. That, um, and whether or not that was normal at, at the time doesn't mean that it's okay. And that the fact that um, we're just okay with it because that's, that's what happened and that was normal, it's still not okay for a lot of people here. And um, the realities of what marginalized people and people of color are still dealing with today because of that, um, I think is largely underestimated and misunderstood. And I think the more that we can understand the history and how that subsequent oppression is still happening today, the more that we can empower people like mm-hmm. that and the more that we can liberate them from from this oppression that is their reality. Um, and I think oftentimes that's just, it's it's overlooked. And as as white people, we, we don't take the time to really understand and see it because it, it's ugly. The truth of that is really ugly and disturbing and, and horrible. And like looking back, you just feel a lot of shame for what our founding fathers did. But I think the more that we can have the courage to sit with that and really understand it, the more that we will understand the oppression that is present today and the more that we can do something about it and realize maybe these subconscious racial tendencies um, that that we have um, that are are really important to look at and and sit in that tension. Mm -hmm. Um, I was reading something, I don't know where it was, but um, the just look at the presidents, you know, and, and who was the best president and why. Um, I was talking with a student about that, and, you know, people do their rankings, who's the best president. Well, how do we know why this person was a good president or not? You know, who was a bad president? Well, was that because he started the Depression? He happened to be during the Depression? FDR was a great president because he brought us out of the Depression. Um, well, did he really bring us out of it? What if he would not have had all those government things and the New Deal... It's just so hard to look back, and but it's really interesting, you know. And I think we do have to, to get that. I read that night or Fahrenheit 451, and so we get a lot of these philosophical discussions about looking at the past because they've reduced uh, Benjamin Franklin. It, you know the premise of Fahrenheit 451 when they burn books and people stop reading on their own accord, um, and firemen show up to people's homes and they burn books or they burn the homes with people in them if they won't get rid of their books. Um, and the history has been retaught to the point where the first fireman was Benjamin Franklin because it was a historical figure who existed and continued throughout history. But history had changed that firemen had always burned books, and the first fireman was Benjamin Franklin. So this icon in American history still remained, but his past had been totally changed. Um, and it's really interesting to see where we go forward with with information that's out there and how we can how it can be manipulated and how you know people don't necessarily look for first well we don't have first person perspectives anymore it's all reading of other biographies and other there's so much misinformation that's out there and you can really get people entrenched into the old ways the horrible norms that used to exist and then also in fabricated stuff it's a really we have more information at our fingertips at any point in human history but so much of it is wrong information if we mm-hmm. let it be and it's um, kind of scary going forward but uh, yeah. yeah yeah absolutely and I think um, again the more we can um, look at what what the truth of that history is and whether you know even thinking about some of those those statues you know I think about if if I was a, a black person and I saw this statue of a man who who stood for slavery and for for like 
for the killing of, of my people and my ancestors. That would be so disturbing to know that this is a statue that other people are praising and um, I have to I have to see every day. You know, um, I think it it's there's a there's a line of respect and there's a line of of justice that has been um, ignored for a really long time and. So I think it's it's really important to, to look at those things and not saying that this person, whoever that statue was, is a totally bad person. I mean, I'm sure that person had a good qualities as well, but the fact of the matter is uh, what actually happened and what they did. And um, so really evaluating that, like how is this affecting people and how is it still playing into the oppression that exists today and showing like, uh, to me that just shows that we don't really care how it's affecting people. Um, marginalized people in that way yeah, yeah and I think a little off of what mm-hmm. you're saying Anna but um I think that we all want that happy perfect story right so we'll idealize people or like put them up on a pedestal or like make the story so it's like shiny and bright and whatever mm-hmm. and like yeah put yeah so I think that and what you were saying before Anna that really resonates with me with like some things are not good some mm-hmm. things are not okay sometimes the stories are hard to hear you don't always have the fairy tales ending you don't always have the and they all lived happily ever after we all want that right we all want to paint these even olympic athletes that they're these perfect people who mm-hmm. um you know the olympics is going on now and we're like put them up on this high pedestal because they're so amazing they must be flawless uh no Mm -hmm. everybody they're still people right and i think like from a small scale from a big scale from people in our history from people in our past we all want to see these like great truths about people which isn't a bad thing i think that we should identify the very positive things that people can bring to something but some things that we did in the past and that we're currently doing is wrong Mm -hmm. and i think that we don't necessarily sit with it in a way that's like wow, some things I'm doing or thinking or these subconscious views that I have that have been created by my environment and my family is maybe not right, Mm -hmm. right? And so just questioning yourself on a deeper level that we do have like some things that we're not proud of, right? In our history, in our current lives, in, you know, our ancestors, like so easy, like even my family's guilty of it, like, there are some skeletons in the closet and we have swept everything under the rug. Like, Ooh, we don't want to talk about that uncle. Mm. Mm. Cause that's not pleasant to talk about. Right. But maybe that uncle had a mental disorder and it's important to talk about. Yeah. Right. Like there are, there are things like that that happen both directly, indirectly, and on a small scale, on a big scale, that the more we can just talk about things and expose things that are weaknesses or shame or things that we're not proud of, I think, we can have better conversations and we can move forward as a society. Where do you think humor comes in with that? A lot of comedians use stereotypes as kind of a way to laugh at certain observations because there's some observable truth in a stereotype that's then the stereotype, you know, takes up to the next step. But what about comedians who joke or laugh about those sort of observations? Is that hurting or is that a good step that we can laugh about some of these things. Um, Chris Rock had a funny bit that, um, you know, white people more depressed. And he says, well, why are you depressed? You know, you're white. And that's, you know, people laugh at that. And that's, you know, absurd. Do you think that that's helping or is that mm-hmm. kind of, I think it's absolutely helping, especially someone like Chris Rock, who is a black person, and he's had to deal with the consequences of the color of his skin his whole life in a society that's largely white and run by white people. Um, I think humor is the best medicine for some of these really intense realities that people have, um, and even these the really intense reality of our history. And it's it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Humor is and and situations like this um to have that sort of relief yeah <laughs> um I, it yeah this is the truth right absolutely like, these are things that we can laugh at but it's yeah. like oh uh, there's obviously some yeah truth it's there, like oh would it be funny shit he's right <laughs> yeah. yeah for the most part there is yeah. a fine line about like being disrespectful absolutely right? i think yeah. that if you can have tact and humor in a way that does expose the truth 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that is something, again, that we can all relate to or laugh at and not be so serious or intense yeah. about. Mm-hmm. But I think there is a fine line between, like, that tipping point where it, like, makes you feel uncomfortable, where it's like, oh, you're just being disrespectful now. Yeah. yeah. Right? So I think that... Yeah, absolutely. And I think humor is what really... Uh, helps us come together more than anything else, right? Because we can all relate to it. We can all um, laugh together. And I think it's a really powerful tool in that way because when you come at situations like that with heaviness and seriousness, people kind of, ooh, I don't want to go there. That's, that's really intense. Mm-hmm. But when you can come at it with humor and a really clever way like that, people can, oh, that's really funny. But, oh, wow, that's true. Yeah. Let me think about that. Um, it's a, such an easier way to, to approach it um, because most of the time we don't want to sit in that tension or, or that seriousness because it is so heavy and so overwhelming. Um, so, yeah, I think humor is great for that. Yeah. Um, growing up in Kluwak, you know, most uh, predominantly native, uh, one of the things that impacted me the most, it was just how the city claimed me and, and my family and how I'm sure the temptation could have been, well, you represent the race of people who oppressed mine for so long, but they were so kind and, and accepting and, and it was a huge impact uh, on me and just understanding that they have the past they have is so much different than mine mm-hmm. um, and yet they don't hold that against me as a person and, and just have that sort of acceptingness and you're you're part of the community right and you know, there was no so like adopting me into the community it was just we say hi to you every time I go back there they say uh, welcome home and mm-hmm. um, just the love that, that people show and that's the you know, the foundational, again, it goes back to who are you interacting with and how are you interacting with them in your local level can have a huge impact uh, going forward. And that's, you know, the kind of grassroots way of, of dealing with things. But um, Yeah, and I think that that just highlights um, if we can live in a world where we have kindness and respect, we can go a long way, yeah. right? Not to mm-hmm. oversimplify yeah. it, but if we can just be kind and yeah. respectful. That's it. Oh, it's so cheesy, and so oh, just you know, we'll all hold hands and sing kumbaya, which is the oversimplified, sort of ridiculous way. But really, that's what people want. People want to feel connected. People want to feel loved. And doesn't matter if you're a, a masculine hunting type, whatever. That's still at the core of what you want too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know why. Yeah. People feel so uh, feel the need to divide others and, and whip up and be a winner. Like I want to be on the right side and so I'm going to do this and, and you're wrong and so I want to silence you and it's it's destructive and it's wrong and it's bad but mm-hmm. it's part of the things we have to tolerate for now um, or not tolerate but move on with or however we want to put that because it definitely exists for now I don't want it to but it does mm-hmm. yeah. yeah I think what we're kind of in like this this like empathy crisis in our world right now um, that we've like we're saying, it just goes back to that kindness and respect. And the more that you can try to empathize with someone else's situation, no matter how different their beliefs are from you, I think the more we can find that connection. Um, and I think it just goes back to our, our, our daily lives of how disconnected we are from each other and from ourselves. And so then to try to connect on a deeper level in some of these more difficult topics, it feels it's pretty far out there. <laughs> Um, so I think it's really important the more that, that we can um, connect to ourselves as well. Yeah. But a lot of these discussions don't have a conclusion. It's just you love philosophical discussion where you talk around in circles and you think of all the potential ramifications or all the potential ways that it could go and you don't really come to a conclusion. It's like, wow, this is a really difficult issue. Mm-hmm. And you talk it out and I really don't know where I stand or what I think. I can't make a yes or no on this one because it's too complex because right? that's what a lot of things are. Mm-hmm. Um, but just understanding on that sort of level. Yeah, right. and I think that having the conversation, you don't necessarily need to have an answer, but uh, raising the conscious awareness mm-hmm. around something, right? Or like um, just like thinking about it more, reflecting on things, having more of an open mind, not shutting things out as if they don't exist. But I think having the conversation is important and you don't necessarily need to have an answer. Right. And I think that goes back to how this instant gratification, we want an answer. We want it to be solved right away. Yeah. Um, and I think what's what the world is sort of asking us to do now is to not to have this 
right or wrong or this really like tangible answer because there it's the issues right now are really, really complex. I think what it's more asking of us is an, um, an embodiment, that we ourselves embody this. We embody the kindness and the compassion and the empathy. And the more that the majority of us can start to embody those practices in our daily lives, I think the more we will find solutions to these more complex things. Yeah, yeah the manipulators want us to choose a side right now on this issue, adopt this meme, adopt that meme. And it's stuff mm-hmm. stuff but you know there's nothing wrong with talking about these sort of things but, no and it's not necessarily what if it doesn't affect you it might not affect you but what about someone else right you don't care about it but how might someone else react to it and that's got to be the thought about it. Mm-hmm. any uh, any other thoughts closing thoughts there no. no, I mean, we just covered all the issues of the world, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's good for now. <laughs> up, right? yeah. uh, that's why I like talking about yeah. teaching English is always great because you can talk about issues and it doesn't matter what, the kid will come up with an idea and I'll just take the other side of it. And we'll have you thought about this. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine teaching math. Because you can't get into a class discussion about math. Yeah. Like, Here's yeah. a, an equation. Let's talk about equate. No, it's, I can't imagine teaching math and how boring and awful that must be. But I love uh, math. Is cool though. Yeah. I like math. <laughs> yeah, I like knowing. I got an A in calculus my senior year of high school. Now, like basic stuff I can do. But I, Mr. Long, can you help me with the math? Maybe. Oh, right. It's embarrassing, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. The other day, um, when my niece asked me to help her with long division. I was like, uh, let me get on my iPhone. <laughs> yeah. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. It's just buried with the filing cabinet yeah, that has all the math embarrassing. Stuff. It's there. Yeah. yeah. It's gone. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so Amanda and Anna for president. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look us up. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine. You know, it kind of gets deep again, but, uh, the stress that would come with with that job. Oh mm. no, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, people, thank you. No, people digging horrible. Up stuff and, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. it'd be so hard. You'd have to be stand so strong in who you are all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And even if you do, the people are going to attack you for you know. Look, you talked about skeletons in the closet. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad. I was talking to a friend last night from uh, from high school about um, how we're happy that. Facebook and all that stuff and cell phones didn't exist when we were in high school because that embarrassing stuff would be out there. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> but it almost seems like we're getting to a point where that stuff has become so normalized, people just kind of expect it. So I don't know mm-hmm. if it's you got to watch what you put online because someone might dig it up later or it's going to be so prevalent, it's going to be so open that, oh, uh, well, yeah. It's desensitized, it's normal. Yeah. 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 I, I read this um, article. Yeah, it is, yeah. I think it was on the Huffington Post that was saying, like, the next generation, what, um, what will be a luxury is privacy. Yeah. Because mm. privacy isn't really going to exist anymore with how much we're putting our lives online and into technology. And that that's going to be potentially a new movement, like the people who have the privilege to have the privacy. Yeah. 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 Well, the weird thing, too, is because we're like retreating into our own little bubbles where we're not, you know, communing with people or being people, you would think that that would provide you with more privacy because you just go to your job and you mm-hmm. go home and you're not meeting with actual people. But because you're putting so much online, it's, it's yeah, it's weird. Mm-hmm. I have to. Here's a short story that I read uh, with my classes, and it's a it takes place in uh, New England and back east. A lot of areas don't have backyards or fences. It's just kind of an open lawn, and you kind of see into other people's backyards. Arizona too is you know here's my rock garden and your rock garden. Um, so kids in California are reading this about this lake house and you can just see what's going on in other people's yards and kids in California, well, why is this guy, this guy's a creepy stalker. I'm like, no, he's the protagonist. It's not weird. It's just, you are used to, you know, walls that are so high in your backyard being, you know, isolated. No one else can see what goes on back there. And there's no front porches. People don't sit on the front porch. People don't really go for walks and visit with people anymore. It's about your protected little home. Um, that you have to explain that you know, people go for walks. People, it's not a weird thing. Um, sitting on the front porch. I remember my grandparents used to sit on the front porch every evening, and we'd just sit out there, and people would walk by and then come up, or you'd have your garage door open, and you'd sit there, and we would come by with tea, and it was a cool thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It didn't really exist in in 
Unless you live in my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it is. That is one thing I love about Ketchikan is um, the emphasis on community here is a really beautiful thing to witness and people just helping each other out, um, trading things. Yeah. Um, that has been a really beautiful thing to witness and, and be a part of. Yeah. yeah, I really love that about this yeah. place. But you only go to the houses that have the markings that have the same uh, political um, background as you, right? Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> the scarlet letter, yeah. Of, uh, Democrat or Republican. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, that's what's nice about here is people are definitely politically minded, but it's not the number one thing. It's not your main point. Mm-mm. No, your yeah, main, I don't feel that. Purpose, your purpose is. I have all these other things I can put my energy forth, and so if we do want to talk politics, we can, but that's not my daily mission to get, you know, go down to Starbucks and talk politics or talk ridiculousness. Like, there's a lot of ways yeah. you can drive happiness, and if you want to get into a discussion, you can. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Well, anything else? No. Nope. Yep. Where can people find out about uh, or sign up for your... Oh, yeah. <laughs> that <Yeah>. thing. <laughs> um, so you can go to my website, which is feedinghappiness.com, all spelled out. And um, you'll find it on there. If you want to get really specific and try to remember this, you can go to feedinghappiness.com slash Alaska Retreat and find out all the information. Good. Good. Man, any closing thoughts? Where they can find you or what we got going on? Um, most of the stuff is filtered through Anna's uh, Feeding Happiness website right now. But if you want to look for me personally, I'm on Amanda David Chauffeur at uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook. And we have we have information on Facebook too that we and Instagram that we promote about um, just weekend retreats for locals and workshops that we have going on for yoga um so just some really cool things that are happening so it's a good way to check that out yeah and i want to say too just real quick that we um the the big retreat we're doing this summer we realize is a big time commitment and a really um for a lot of people locally is not it's over the fourth of july and as i understand it's a really busy time of year for people here and so what we want to do um is provide some quick like weekend retreats here uh in ketchikan prior to that so be on the lookout for those if that's something you're interested in cool well, thanks for yeah. being on, and um, enjoy the rest of the winter. Yeah. Spring's on its way, slowly. Yay. Pretty, patience, patience. It's stormy right now. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Thanks for having us. Okay.